Coming to you from a studio somewhere. Out there. It's Enough Already Radio with Fingers Malloy and Tracy O'Connors. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome once again to Enough Already. My name is Fingers Malloy. Tracy L. Connors is my co-host for this fantastic podcast. Hello, Tracy. Hello, Fingers. How's Tracy L. Connors? I'm doing quite well. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? I am fantastic. Thank yeah? Thank you. Yeah, I got my car back. No. Yeah, it still needs uh, body work, but at least it runs, and it has four new wheels. Excellent. So... And it, it smells like it's burning every time I'm done driving it. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping it's because there's still oil in places where there shouldn't be oil. Because oh, there was a huge fist size hole in the oil pan. <clears throat> but the bad news is I have to return my Chevy Silverado rental truck. Mm-hmm. Which I really don't want to do because it's really nice. Is it time for an upgrade? Yeah, but I can't afford it. Oh. And on top of it, I drive uh, 200 miles a day. No, I don't drive 200 miles a day. I drive over 100 miles a day, though. Mm. And driving a pickup truck is, is not a good idea. But this truck, you can take your phone uh-huh. and you can like plug it into the truck. Okay. And your phone appears on the stereo. Like the stereo's got like a seven inch screen, nine inch screen. Mm-hmm. And everything you want to do on your phone, you could do it through your stereo. That's pretty sweet. It's amazing. <laughs> like if I call you in this truck, I can it, it pipes through the stereo. Yeah. What, a, what an age we live in. You mean you can't do that in your Malibu? No. Oh. It's a 2012. Yeah. This this thing has CarPlay, they call it. CarPlay. Wow. See, CarPlay. I have a 2011, and it's got mm-hmm. all that. You have CarPlay in your 2011? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, the phone rings. It rings through my car. I just hit a little button and say hello. Can you, can you hang up the phone by touching your stereo? I can. Well, Jesus Christ. You mean this has been around for a while? Yes. Where Remind me been? again where you work. <laughs> I don't want to say. I know. But let's just say it's some place where you should know these things. <laughs> this has been around since 2011? At least, if not earlier than that. And this is all done through Bluetooth, mind you. What's Bluetooth? Oh, dear God. Ask your six-year-old. <laughs> I'm kidding. I still I have someone in the neighborhood that uses one of those Bluetooth earpieces. No. Yeah. So. I, I look at it and I think, did you get that at the 2004 World's Fair? <laughs> you just can't let it go. Uh oh! Oh, they're coming for me. <laughs> yeah, so I got to take the damn truck back, and I'm upset about it. I'm sorry. And I'm stuck driving my 2012 Malibu, but mm-hmm. I can't get rid of the damn thing because it's got a. Uh, and I know this is going to be fascinating to the audience, but what do I care? Uh, it's got a a rebuilt title on it. Okay. So it was a salvage vehicle that was rebuilt. And now it's a rebuilt title. It doesn't have a clear title. So this car would probably be worth you know $9,000 if it had a clear title. But when I had the, the car in to get it worked on, the dealership offered me $1,500 for it. Whoa. Because <laughs> of, of the title status. Jeez. Like, you're not selling it. Seriously. Even if I were really hard up. Right. Like, reliable transportation. It only has 70,000 miles on it for $1,500. Yeah, you could do better selling it privately. Yeah. Well, well the you, dealership's you, always going to lowball you. Well, yeah, that's true. But even privately, people are, are only going to want to offer, you know, maybe even 50 cents on the dollar because, you know, if it's a rebuilt title, people don't know who rebuilt the car. 
Yeah, you know, sure. it just passed inspection. Well, we all know how good state regulators are when it comes <laughs> to that or anything else. Mm-hmm. So I could have been the last person. If, if I had rebuilt that car, I could have been uh, the last person to get to the, the BMV before this dude's coffee break. So he may the not BMV? even. Have... Yeah, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Oh, is that what you guys call it in Indiana? I believe so. Oh. I've never heard of that. We have the DMV. Well, there's a DMV, the BMV. In oh, Michigan, it's the sec- the, in Michigan, it's the Secretary of State's office. That's bizarre. Where you go to take all that stuff. <sighs> what a world we live in. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it could be right before the dude's coffee break. Doesn't even look at your car. Yeah, it looks good to me. <laughs> Sign off on it. So, did you hear Randy Quaid? I did. You were kind enough to send that to me. He he's a genius. Mm-hmm. I, I, I we didn't talk about uh, bringing this up on the show. No, that's why I started chuckling because I saw this. It came up in my timeline again. Mm-hmm. North Korean leader Kim Jong Un <laughs> stated <laughs> that he has the nuclear button. On his desk at all times. <laughs> Will someone from his depleted, food starved regime please inform <laughs> him that I too have a nuclear button? This is old. But it is okay. much more powerful, much bigger than his, and my button works. <laughs> <laughs> He's just reading Trump's tweets, right? Yeah, that that was the old one that that came out to, back in January. And does he have the strobe effect on that one? Yeah, as well? he's got the strobe effect on this one or on that one. Uh, this this mm-hmm. one. Uh, oh, is that was that the pin tweet? Oh, that's his button works. No, there was another one that he just came out with. Oh, the witch hunt. Yeah, if, if, if you've heard the witch hunt again, yeah. he's got the strobe effect. This, this is brilliant. So disgraceful that the questions concerning the Russian witch hunt were leaked to the media. No questions on collusion. Oh, I see. You have a made-up phony crime, collusion, and an investigation begun with illegally leaked Classified information. <laughs> nice. It would seem very hard to obstruct justice for a crime that never happened. Witch hunt. <laughs> oh my god, the man is a genius. Yes. Oh. He's a Canadian treasure. He is, but he should just do that for all the tweets. Yeah. Great. I love the North Korean one, but uh, the, the way that he yells witch hunt at the end. <laughs> well, I feel like it's an Orson Welles impersonation, isn't it? Yeah. Mm, perfect. And the... Yes. <laughs> it's a shame that he is hiding somewhere in a cabin. <laughs> In Canada. It's just stunning that he, he must understand all of this to a certain degree. I feel like he agrees with Trump's tweets, and that's why he's doing this. He's not doing it to mock him. It's hard I, to tell, but... It, who knows? I, I think the North Korean one was mocking him, but then he, he comes around with that that one, and it's just like, okay, it, it seems like he's he's somewhat intellectually honest. Yeah. You know, but he, when he reads it like that, it makes it sound a lot different than the way it's presented in the press. Yeah. So. I can't believe we spent the last five minutes talking about Randy Quaid, but what the hell? Hey, it's better than talking about Stormy Daniels, which is what everybody else has been doing all week, despite all the other things that are going on. Boy, what? The things that the porn industry can do <laughs> to a woman. I mean, I cannot believe she's, what, 38? 
I think we figured that out. Yeah, she's my age. She looks like she's almost 50. Mm-hmm. She's putting a lot of work, fingers. <laughs> I mean, think about the lifestyle for a second. Ugh. We'll, we'll, we'll get past the... We won't talk about the the porn shoots, which have to be a disaster. But they <laughs> supplement their incomes by touring the country and and dancing at strip clubs. Mhm. What she's doing right now. Mhm. And uh, it's a horrible lifestyle to be a bartender, Tracy, yeah. because you're you're up until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, you're surrounded by people who are drinking. Um you, you go to bed late. Imagine the lifestyle of a stripper and a touring stripper at that. She's taking time away from her busy porn schedule. <laughs> to hop on a bus, hop on a plane, whatever, to get mm-hmm. to uh, Deja Vu in Saginaw, Michigan. <laughs> and then two weeks from now, she'll be at uh, the Platinum Club in Denver. You know, I mean, it's... It, it's, it's You start your, your night at 10 o'clock at night. Strip clubs are open, uh, I'm told, uh, until like 4 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know you're you're you, you whip into town. The locals probably resent the hell out of you mm-hmm. because you're getting paid a lot of money to be there, and they're there every night. And I I I haven't seen one yet. Like if, if Stormy Daniels, for instance, is she really going to bring in more people to the strip club? I guess so. I mean, maybe. So maybe her appearance will bring more people in to spend money on the other strippers. But, you know, you, you, it starts at 10 o'clock, something like that, not, you know, 930, and you go till 4 in the morning. You know there's like a brick of cocaine in the women's <laughs> dressing room. And that's how, it, you know, you could turn a moderately uh, younger woman or moderately attractive younger woman into someone who looks 15 years older than she is Mm -hmm. because of that lifestyle. Mm. So you're thinking Coke. I would think meth. You think it's meth? Mm. I mean, how do me a favor folks uh, who are, who are listening, you drug dealers out there tweet uh, at fingers. Let me know uh, the cost of meth versus cocaine. I'm curious. I think, I think meth, meth is pretty cheap. Yeah, meth's cheap. I would think that cocaine would be the the drug of choice with strippers. I don't know. Keeps you let's thin do, yeah, without messing with your teeth. It's true, but you can just buy new teeth. <laughs> Why yeah, not if you're buying everything else? Yeah, I guess that's true, but it does something to your mouth, too. <laughs> you ever okay. see, it's, it's not just the uh, the the missing teeth, but then it, it, and maybe this is because of the missing teeth, but like the you get like a lower, uh, what do you call it, an underbite? Yeah, I your call this meth kind, mouth. Meth yeah, mouth. your chin yeah. kind of starts sticking out, and I mean maybe if they implant new teeth in the face, <laughs> that goes away, but still there it, there'd have to be some sort of meth footprint on your face, even if you got <laughs> new teeth. Don't you think? Yeah. Well, you can shoot it up too, I believe. You can you don't shoot have to smoke meth? it. I believe oh. so. I watch a lot more television than you do. <laughs> I have never understood people who could look like with the heroines. Okay. Mm. Mm-hmm. They they put it. Uh, they cook it in a spoon. Yes. With like a knife underneath, or a knife, a uh, a, spoon, a lighter. Yeah. Yeah. Underneath, they cook it and then they inject it into their veins. Mm-hmm. They have to tie the little rubber band thing around their their arms, like they're they're nurses. And then mm-hmm. they inject it in their veins, and then they'll have some junkie next to them wanting to use that needle. Yeah, and that's, well, that's how, how you get Cuban clean super needle aids. programs. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm. I just I just googled it. Can you shoot up meth? Yes. Ugh. Google says it's true. You can do it. You can smoke it, snort it, or inject it. There you go. And it's dirt cheap. I believe so. 
Okay, so maybe it is meth. Anyway, the, the, <laughs> the point is, it's it's a hell of a lifestyle, Tracy yeah. O'Connor's. Between the, the porn shoots, <clears throat> and then they uh, apparently they have to take the still photos afterwards right, at right. the porn shoots. So it's a, then, it's a 14-hour day. And she's spending a lot of her time on t-shirt design. <laughs> There's that, too. No, you're right. Which, yes. You were right. Which, you, this is all about getting rich. Of course it is. What else would it be about? And it's you about dug attention up the, and money. You, you dug up the story about the t-shirts. Yeah, The Hill had a story. Stormy Daniels promotes her t-shirts that are mocking Trump. So she's got a little deal going on. Hashtag Team Stormy. So mm-hmm. if you if you want to represent, you can spend 25 bucks on a t-shirt that just has that hashtag written on it. You'll be the coolest guy in the bar. <laughs> and the photos on the site are awesome. The models. It's so cheesy. I don't know why she didn't just have Michael Avenatti do it, her lawyer. But this guy looks almost as uh as cheesy as he is the, the smell still... of vinegar <laughs> flying off your computer screen when you no, see these I got pictures. a whiff of Jakar Noir <laughs> but yeah you can get it you can get the Stormy Daniels bracelet I'm either gonna laugh in, that off even though I wear Jakar go ahead in um you know like the the, the live strong bracelets that people still wear <laughs> yeah that style I think those are three bucks or you can get a nice fancy metal looking one which this guy is wearing both of them in this photo when he's got the Team Stormy t-shirt, $25. <laughs> and then there's another one with a picture that looks like the front cover of a magazine with her on it that says fake news is be- or fake boobs are greater than fake news. Very clever. And uh, my Well, favorite- I do agree with her that. Uh, well, sure. There's that, but anyway, go ahead. But my favorite part was I was like, oh, okay, 25 bucks isn't too bad. But you know where they always get you is the shipping. Right. So I looked at the shipping, and if I wanted to get one of these T-shirts, and I wanted it by, say, tomorrow, mm-hmm. $80.69 oh, for God. next day air. And then it says, parenthetically, two days. So that's not really <laughs> next day air. But 80 bucks? No. No. I can get it sent one in one to three days for three seventy five. <laughs> <laughs> Does that include I, a hand job? That's what I, I don't know. know. I'm like, is anybody ordering this and is like, I have to have this by tomorrow? <laughs> I'm so much so that I'm willing to pay 80 bucks. Good God. Which is three times the cost of the shirt. Have you ever needed a t-shirt so badly that you needed it in two days shipped no. to you? No. It's a, it's a freaking t-shirt. Right. It's not a syringe that you're going to inject <laughs> meth into your body with. No, and here's the thing. You can go to stores like Michael's, the craft stores, and yeah. get um, iron-on stuff. So you could go print out. I mean, they didn't even use like a cool font or anything like that. It's like a mm-hmm. stencil font. I could go print up a Steam a Team Stormy t-shirt myself. $5.99. I'm, looking, mm-hmm. I'm looking at her photo right now, and don't mind me, uh, and, I, and I really don't need people uh, giving me shit for objectifying a, 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 an extortionist who is a porn star. Uh, <laughs> but... Does she, is she chunky? No. No? Not is it just the boobs like pop yeah. out so much that it makes her look a little beefy? Mm-hmm. And, and I say this fully acknowledging that I'm a, a, a huge fat ass, okay? So, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, there's a picture of her with Alec Baldwin playing Trump. Yes, from right next last to each night's other. SNL. Yeah. And I can't tell if she's beefy or not. No. No, she's not. I guess not. No, she's normal. Except for the yeah, 38 Gs that she's carrying. Yeah, the buoys. <laughs> yeah, but um, God, what, it's a hell of a life. It is. But I hate that we're talking about her. <laughs> I do. It, it's so annoying to turn on the news every night, and this is the lead on CNN and MSNBC every hour at the top of the hour. Think of all the t-shirts. I bet she sold at least seven t-shirts off this so far. <laughs> and with the two-day shipping, what's what's the math there? Let me get a calculator. Eight yeah. times. Uh, 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 it would be $5,600. 56, 56, yeah. Or, or $560. Sorry. Yeah. I added too many zeros. <laughs> well, you're a girl. Math is hard. I know. Math is hard. <laughs> Okay, so she was on Saturday Night Live on Saturday, which was convenient because it's Saturday yes. Night Live. 
Uh, and yeah, I heard about it. I didn't watch it because I really and I hate to sound like a an old fart, which is why I don't uh, listen to myself on the radio very much because I sound like an old fart all the time. But I haven't watched Saturday Night Live in a long, long time. No, all which, anybody ever watches are the clips anyway. Yeah, but they, you know, back during the whole Clinton Monica Lewinsky thing, they had Monica Lewinsky on the show. Hmm. Or at least they had Monica Lewinsky on. It may have been after the scandal had died down. But uh, they didn't have Monica on demanding Bill Clinton resign. Yeah. It was. No, more... she didn't really demand it. I watched the whole painful thing, and it's oh. seven and a half minutes long. The New York Post said that she demanded that he resign. She or mentions that he should resign, yes. Oh. And then throws in something about how he doesn't care about global warming. <laughs> yeah. No, she's not politically motivated at all. Well, uh, but on top of that, if you know, when I hear about some sort of climate disaster, I immediately <laughs> think we need to go to climate change expert Stormy Daniels. Yeah, I know she should change her name to Super Stormy Daniels. <laughs> We've got to up the terror threat here from these super storms. Did she really say you don't know anything about global warming? No, you don't believe in it or something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. You don't care about climate change or some such thing. Oh. It was it's it's painful to watch. Well, I think if she if Stormy really cares about climate change, she shouldn't be traveling the country. Correct. Going to these strip clubs. If she really cares, think of all the damage she's doing to the environment by hopping on these planes, <laughs> getting on these buses. Yep, the hypocrisy thing never works though. Oh, drat. Yeah, I know. All right, let's talk about real news. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so sick of that story. We got we got to stop talking about it too. Well, uh, if, if, if nah, I won't go there. Okay, go go ahead. Let's talk about real news. <laughs> well, I'm sure right now everybody's heard about the uh, the rebuke from the judge in Virginia to the uh, special counsel guys that were there representing Team Mueller against Team Manafort. Have they? You even heard about that, right? Yeah, I have, but uh, you know, I follow people on Twitter that talk about it. Was it really wi- widely reported on the news? I mean, w- uh, it was reported, you know, even on. I believe I even saw them talking about it a little bit on either CNN or MSNBC. It was kind of a big deal that the judge smacked down the uh, Mueller guys, and the main argument coming from the judge seems to be that what they're looking at Manafort for just why he's in court is money laundering and bank fraud charges Mm -hmm. having to deal with, I believe the Ukrainian a group of Ukrainians, which the judge pointed out, excuse me, you're only talking to me about Ukrainians. I thought this Mueller thing was about Russians. (laughs) Well, and Manafort's been under investigation since I want to say 2005. (laughs) What? And, uh, but the, uh, the things in question about this Russian stuff is is from around that time period, too. So there was already an investigation going on into Manafort before he was even part of the Trump campaign, mm-hmm. which is what this judge raises. So the judge is saying to the, the uh, people that are there on behalf of the special counsel, how are you telling why is this even coming up? This was a crime that was already under investigation. This is not something because it's supposedly the scope says um, it's all about what they find in the course of the investigation. So mm-hmm. if during the course of this special counsel investigation into the Trump-Russia connections, they found out that Manafort had been doing this, then they could bring it in front uh-huh. of the court. But they're saying since you guys already knew this, the Department of Justice was already investigating it, and they just rolled it over into your thing. This is not new news. This was not uncovered during the course of your investigation. So I don't think that it's pertinent at all. And then the uh, special counsel guys argue, well, it is under the purview. And so the judge pushes back. So apparently Rod Rosenstein, who is the acting attorney general in this case, because Sessions recused himself, Mm -hmm. gave two different sets of guidance to the special prosecutors. 
I believe one is comes out in May, I think, and then he released a second one in August. And the second one was given to the judge. Both of the judge has seen both of them, but the judge says the second one was heavily redacted, so he has no idea if what the special counsel saying in his courtroom is true or not. And he is asked to see an unredacted version that supposedly gives these guys carte blanche to reach backwards in time into an investigation that was already <laughs> ongoing and then use that. And the judge says, I think what you're doing is trying to use this against Manafort to make him squirm and flip on Trump. Right. Duh. Uh, yeah. Duh. Yeah. And he also raised the question because the Michael Cohen stuff what that they uncovered, they handed off to uh, New York jurisdiction it's not going to be part of the special counsel thing so the judge is saying why would you do that with the cohen stuff explain it to me and he kind of smacked around this this uh the the person that was there representing the uh, special counsel's office mr dree dree bean dree bean, i guess mm-hmm. yeah yeah he's pushing him back like hey you guys were given 10 million dollars right this budget for your little investigation and Jermaine says, uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's what we got approved for. And he's like, have you spent all of it? And he won't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the hell could they spend $10 million on? What are these lawyers billing their hourly at? Well, between that and they're, they're always adding new lawyers. Oh, of course. They added so a couple keep, this week, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. You keep uh, adding to the staff. There goes your $10 million. But what is the excuse for the redacted part of this memo? Is it? They're saying national security or some bullshit? Of course. And the judge said, hey, I've got a skiff in the basement here. And for those of you who don't know, the skiff is the the, the clean room where you have to Mm -hmm. go in and read the stuff. That's the one. Hillary had one of those in her house that she routinely left unlocked. (laughs) I'm not kidding. That came out during the during the uh, whole investigation. But yeah, so the judge says, hey, bring it. You got two weeks. You're bringing this thing to me. I'm going to read it. No, they aren't going to bring it. And then no. it'll be interesting to see what happens next. Are we going to have contempt of court? I don't know. I mean, this judge is not playing with these guys. And it's it's a pretty entertaining transcript. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But they're also saying in this that um, the, the attorneys, Manafort's attorney said, look, we understand, it's, it's our understanding, and this guy worked, Manafort's attorney, that is, who also has a name that starts with a D. So I'm flipping through here trying to find him. Mr. Downing. Mm. He worked at the at the uh, Justice Department. So he's like, I know how this works. And Rosenstein is infamous for keeping memos about everything. So we believe that there should be an outline of what the scope of the special counsel was allowed to look into somewhere. Uh-oh. And we'd like to see that. I know. I know. This is what happens when you Google math. It's true. They're always watching us. <laughs> so that was what happened in the courtroom in Virginia with the special counsel. But now my favorite thing that happened as far as uh, the Mueller team getting egg on its face in a courtroom happened, I believe, in a Washington courtroom over the weekend. This came out on Saturday. So as everybody celebrated in the, the lefty media, There were those indictments that came down back in February, I believe, of the 13 Russians Mm -hmm. and a few Russian companies. And everybody was cheering like, look, you got scalps. This is awesome. And we looked at that and said, oh, that's great. 13 Russians that are never going to come back and stand (laughs) trial. How convenient. (laughs) Well, not so fast. So one of the... um, the businesses that's named in this suit is called Concord Management and Consulting. And there's also Concord Catering, which cracks me up. So Concord Catering was indicted. Concord Catering is owned by this guy named, and forgive me, Mr. Whatever, I can't pronounce this correctly, Yevgeny mm-hmm. Prigzovin, Prigzin, whatever. We're just going to call him Yev- Yevgeny. So this guy sucked up to Putin for years. and Just call him Yakov. Yes. Schmear enough. <laughs> so he's referred to as Putin's chef. Okay. And we've talked about him previously. He he sucked up to Putin and Putin reciprocated his, you know, 
He's not one to turn away sycophants. So this guy now, I believe he has the contract to supply all of Moscow's schools with food. And he's got a bunch of what we would call five-star restaurants in Moscow that Putin frequents. So he's the one that built this Russian troll farm, apparently, Mm -hmm. which is Concord Management. You know, it's housed under these things in Concord Catering. So attorneys representing Concord Catering showed up in court. (laughs) And they're demanding discovery. Which Uh-oh. Is, yeah, which has scared the hell out of the Mueller guys. So the Daily Mail had a, a piece about this that came out uh, in the last 24 hours. The, the headline is, A blow for Mueller as judge, judge slaps down his request for delay in Russia troll farm case. <laughs> So a federal judge has rejected a request from special counsel Robert Mueller's prosecutors dealing uh, dealing with the probe, uh, dealing the probe a legal blow. U.S. District Court Judge Davni Friedrich issued the brief order on Saturday evening denying Mueller's request to delay the scheduled Sunday arraignment for Concord Management and Consulting. Uh, The prosecutors expected the case to proceed without any appearance uh, or defense from the foreign defendants and were stunned when two lawyers appeared on Concord's behalf last month and began demanding extensive document production from the Mueller probe. Can you imagine the prosecutors sitting at their desks in front of the judge? They probably got there a little bit early, hoping that they could just knock this out, figuring nobody was going to show up. And then two, (laughs) two lawyers show up. Can you imagine the oh shit moment? Right, and imagine how much money these guys have behind them. Yeah. So they're not giving this up, and they're going to make these people look like the clowns that they are. Wow. Yeah. And keep in mind, you know, this this Concord management that they're referring to, Mm -hmm. the the feds want you to believe, the lib feds want you to believe, that Concord management, along with uh, the other trolls... Yes. ...somehow talked you into voting for Donald Trump. Correct. And I did. I read the indictment against them, mm-hmm. which is it's pretty interesting. And it the, one of the most glaring things to me is they talk about them buying these Facebook ads and, you know, creating fake U.S. personas. And they do mm. lay out later on in it. There's a quite a bit of identity fraud that went on, which is, I, I hadn't heard of that reported anywhere. These This is why you got to read these documents yourself. So they did steal a bunch of people's Social Security numbers. And then set up bank accounts in their names and PayPal accounts and stuff like that to pay for these things. But, um, well, that's a no, no. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, that's a clear violation of the law, but it's also, they violated FEC laws by not registering as foreign agents and all this kind of stuff. But they also don't say they make reference, I believe to the, um, the budget that this group had, which was $1.5 million a month, I believe. But they don't tell you how much of that was spent in the U.S. elections because they were doing all kinds of other stuff. So it's a fraction of that. And this has been going on for a long time. It wasn't just the Mm -hmm. 2016 election that Russians have tried to stick their noses in our election or or other elections throughout the globe. But this is the one that they're focused on because Hillary lost. Right. So in the in the indictment, it says Concord funded the organization, which is what they call this overarching thing. As part of a larger Concord-funded interference operation that is referred to as Project Lata. Project, I'm sorry? Lata? Lata Gravis? Lata. Oh, Lata. Lata. Oh, okay. L-A-K-H-T-A. Okay. That had multiple components, some involving domestic audiences within the Russian Federation and others targeting foreign audiences in various countries, including the United States. So by, in, or around September 2016, the organization's monthly budget for Project LACTA submitted to Concord exceeded 73 million Russian rubles, which is just over 1.25 million, including approximately 1 million rubles in bonus payments. So, and we all kind of know what these guys were doing, right? They set up a bunch of Twitter accounts. One of them was actually pretty huge, and I I'd never saw this reported either. It was... Um, it was masquerading as a Tennessee Republican group. It was at 10 underscore GOP. And I remember seeing that account. It had a ho- over 100,000 followers. Hmm. That was the Russians. So, but they also set up these pages like Muslims for Hillary. 
Okay. Which is really strange. That might not, I'll, I'll find it. And United Muslims of America. Okay. Mm. So they had that going on on Facebook. They also had a Black Lives Matter group going on on Facebook. And the Muslims of, uh, of um, United Muslims of America put on a pro Hillary rally. And then a couple weeks later, or by the end of the, the election cycle and nearing the election, the day of the election, they had turned on her and were calling for Muslims to boycott the election. So it's very bizarre. They're involved with, you know, contacting local parties on the ground and trying to get them to participate in events. And it seems more than one time they were able to get somebody to dress up like Hillary in a prison jumpsuit. <laughs> Which we all we both know totally swung the election. Yes. But, it, it, you know, they were putting on stuff on both sides of this protests and counter protests. Like even after the election, they had a yay Trump won rally in New York. And at the same time, uh, oh, my God, he's not my president rally in New York. <laughs> so the overarching thing that they wanted to accomplish was turmoil. Right. Which they've succeeded in beyond their wildest dreams. But it'll be over a year and a half from that now, and it's still going on and yes. being incredibly disruptive. And it, now the special counsel spent who knows how much, over $10 million with this nonsense. And they're and about we, to get laughed out of court because <laughs> the caterer showed up. And now we're going to try to make this, because <laughs> the, the house of cards is falling, we're going to try to make this about Stormy Daniels now. Mm-hmm. Well, that's how they're going to get him. Yeah. Yeah, campaign finance violations. So. Which I, I had to laugh because uh, if, do you remember when we first started talking about this with Michael Cohen and the payoff? And I said, I don't think people understand how organizations like this operate. He probably just had money sitting aside to shut people up. <laughs> hush money. <laughs> yeah. He's got a hush money slush fund. <laughs> and that's apparently that's what I'm you know, reading between the lines all week, this seems to be what Rudy Giuliani's saying. Yeah, if you like, are, if you're Donald Trump's lawyer, you're a firefighter. Yes. And instead <laughs> of water, you have money. And you make it rain with the money to put out the fire. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need a little bit more water or money to put out the fire. So you ask Donald Trump, hey, I need a little bit more money to put out the fire. Donald oh, Trump says, sure, well, you, you, you just say you need a little bit more money, and even if Donald Trump says, where's the fire, which he probably wouldn't, but if he does say, where's the fire, uh, his lawyer will probably say, you, you don't need to know that. No, I think what happens is he pays them, and at the end of the month, he goes to Donald and said, this is how much our fire insurance costs this month. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense, right? You keep him totally in the dark about this, what's going on. And he's just like, okay, here's a check. So Rudy made the case, and I think he's right, that this would have happened regardless of whether there was a campaign going on. Yeah. Yeah, who doesn't believe that? Of course. I mean, how many of the, what we've seen Stormy and how many other women? There's I, I can't remember the other one, the playmate. But the thing, I, I don't know if it would or not, because, I mean, really, who would give a shit about if, if if Donald Trump is banging a porn star if he's not president of the United States? Would anybody be surprised? Well, he might care a little bit. Yeah, but it wouldn't it wouldn't have risen to this level of uh, national no, but, attention. Right. But and look at how how small the extortion payment was or the right. shut up money. It was one hundred and thirty grand. So this he, is not like he's thrown parties that have cost way more than that. Of course. So they, yeah. you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I there was a out there's an uh, the latest conservative outrage on social media was uh, Kurt Schlichter tweeting that uh, he's starting to not care if Donald Trump used her like uh, a teenager uses. Kleenex. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm paraphrasing. Throws it away like use Kleenex. And, yeah. And everybody starts going crazy on, on Twitter, especially people on the right saying, oh, that's disgusting how you talk about women. And it's like, what? Oh, people need to calm down. I mean, they've been hyped up since the, the uh, correspondence dinner. 
Yeah. S- or, Stormy Daniels is not I'm every woman. No, She's but a, it, the extortionist. It doesn't matter if she is. Everybody needs to lighten the hell up. They love on the right to go after the left for being snowflakes. Right. And then watching everybody freak out about what Michelle Wolf said at the correspondence center. Oh, my God. How dare she? Where are my pearls? Find me the nearest feigning couch. You don't see how ridiculous you look and you're doing the same exact stuff you make fun of the left for. Right. Grow up. You think Sarah Huckabee Sanders needs you white knighting for her? <sighs> Apparently Come on. they do. And the abortion jokes, I, I, I look. I didn't watch the whole thing. And like you said about Saturday Night Live, I saw a couple of clips. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know how many people outside of the media bubble in D.C. and New York City sit down to watch the White House correspondence dinner. Right. I mean, I watched her. I watched Michelle Wolf said it's about twenty minutes. What were there any funny jokes in it? Yeah, it was all right. I mean, I wasn't. You know me. I don't get offended. Well, no, it's I, I get that, but when I, I just heard saw the, the ab- abortion joke, I knew that the right was going to go nuts. Yeah, and instead of looking at it and saying, "You know what?" She just brought the reality of what that is into clear focus, and you should kind of thank her for making it as disgusting as it really is. Right. You know, at least she's honest about it. So just just calm down. It makes no difference in the world. And Sarah Huckabee Sanders does not care if you're on her side or not. She's going to go to work on Monday and get called a liar by everybody. Which is, that's her job, right? Spinning for the president. Well, that's what's funny about the whole thing. And and I wish I had the tweet in front of me, but it was someone from the New York Times stating, uh, you know, how she, why aren't people shocked that the the press secretary lies on a daily basis. It's like, <laughs> how long have you been in politics? Right. But what was he, this person, I assuming it's a man. Um, yes. Saying that, that he was shocked that she he's lies every day. Sh- he's shocked that there, there isn't uh the, the reaction uh, is not what he's expecting from the nation that the press secretary lies uh, on a daily basis as if, he was in a coma for the past, uh, you know, during the whole Obama administration. And before that, the Bush administration. And before that, uh, the, the Clinton administration. That's what the press secretary does. The press secretary lies on a daily basis. Yes. Like, I, and I saw, uh, I believe it's Stephen Miller. He's at Red Steez on Twitter, was fighting with that guy. And I caught some of it because he said, oh, yeah, like the time that Jay Carney said he knows three Hillary Rosens. <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, how many times did they say Obama learned about this on TV? Right. It's the first time he's ever heard of it. And uh, the whole you can keep your doctor garbage that they they all spun for him. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. This is what they do. I mean, they're shocked. They, they're, they constantly talk about how much Trump lies. Yeah. As if this is a new phenomenon. It's like, oh. What what kills me about Trump and his lies, though, some of them are just so unnecessary. Yeah, they are stupid. I mean, I, when you tweet out about your uh, the attendance at your inauguration. Which he still hasn't <laughs> admitted to. It's like, really? You really need to tweet that your inauguration was, uh, what, what was the tweet? Do you remember? It was either I, more was than Obama's about- highest attended right. inauguration in history or something. It's like, oh, come on, dude. Why? Well, it's a semantical game, right? Yeah. Because if, if you look at all of the uh, the people that watched it live on the internet, it's probably incalculable. So they can get away with that. But going to the mat over it was ridiculous. Yeah. Just leave it alone. Well. <sighs> I'm 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 trumped out. I'm well, I do Daniels have a doubt. right. Right. There was one story that the press has ignored to a certain extent, but I think maybe they'll pick up on because it's it's easy enough. It's gossipy tabloid stuff. And that's why I found it at uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) people.com that President Trump wants Colin Kaepernick and Kanye West to come to the White House to participate in a summit on race. Oh, how ridiculous is this? I think it's genius. Are you kidding? Uh, How is this any different than a beer summit? It's. Well, it's not. 
<laughs> well, I thought it was ridiculous. The beer summit was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So, and that's the thing that's going to be funny is how the beer summit in the media was treated as as, as a genius move, and this is going to be uh, vilified. Well, he's put Kaepernick in a pretty tough position, right? Right. Because he has trashed him quite a bit, but now Kanye West has opened up a door to a parallel universe where Colin Kaepernick might be shamed into coming. Mm-hmm. Because he will get pressure put on him. Like, this is an olive branch outreach. Let's see what we can do. Well, let's see how serious he really is about this. Because you would think if he's really serious about the issues that he champions, he would jump at the opportunity to go to the White House Mm -hmm. to talk to the President of the United States about them. Mm -hmm. If you're a serious player. And and how long have you and I, I, I believe my entire life, we've heard we need to have a national conversation about race. Right. Here you go. So they said it's going to be a couple a, a couple day event. So they want to have um, entertainers and singers in and then also a bunch of athletes. But, you, you know, as well as so, I do, they don't want to have a national conversation. They want to have a national lecture on race. Well, we'll see how it goes. I mean, I know that they want to have a photo op. But it may end up like, I, I don't know the, the woman's name, but I think there was a an award ceremony in the White House last week with, a, I believe it was a National Teacher of the Year or something. Mm-hmm. And she wouldn't shake the president's hand. No, class act. Yeah, and then handed I don't, her. I handed I'd have a hard a, time. So, I Look. If I would have been invited to the White House to receive an award from Barack Obama, I would have shook his hand. I wouldn't. And I would have smiled and I would have accepted the award because he's president of the United States. I think Ben Ben Carson handled it properly when he was respectful when he disagreed with the president. Sure. He's the president of the United States. Look, I think, look, Bill Clinton's a scumbag rapist. (laughs) Okay. Allegedly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, all right, allegedly. And don't don't give me the whole, f- oh, you, you, you saw that on Fox News. Uh, read the book, No One Left to Lie to, by mm-hmm. Christopher Hitchens. Google, or, or do a YouTube search for Bill Clinton rapist Christopher <laughs> Hitchens. <laughs> and listen to Christopher lay out the case. Lie out the case? Lay out. Lay, lay out the case. Uh, for uh, the, the, the evidence... That he presents is quite compelling, and uh, but if I were invited during the Clinton years, I would have uh, I would have shook his hand, and then I would have taken uh, some hand sanitizer after I was done. <laughs> you wouldn't have lopped off your hand mind. and stuck it in the, <laughs> the dry cleaning bag. It's the president of the United States. Use that platform. I get that. Use the platform if you want to. To disagree with the president, but do it in a respect, respectful manner. Don't act like an eight-year-old. Okay. That's all. Fair enough. Well, fingers are like this. So this this summit was arranged by um, a pastor that you probably saw out on the trail with, with uh, Trump, Daryl Scott. Okay. He's helping to coordinate all of this. And uh, he's the one that convinced Trump to do this. So they're saying, you know, there's going to be athletes, musicians, and people of multiple races and ethnicities. Scott says he wants it to be a melting pot. But this is what I loved. Who are the uh, athletes that they're already talking about? <laughs> Jim Brown, of course. Okay. Of the Cleveland Browns. Mm-hmm. Vander Holyfield. Mm-hmm. Herschel Walker. And Mike Tyson. <laughs> and Scott says these guys are already on the president's side. I think did I I didn't see it, but I thought I saw Snoop Dogg mm-hmm. last week tweet uh, a picture of Kanye or manipulated a picture of Conway and made him white. Yes, that's what's yep. going to happen to these athletes. Yeah, if they show up to the summit. It depends. At a certain point, though, I do, I do believe, and I don't know who I heard this from, so I wish I could give them credit that courage is contagious. And I think Kanye stepping out like this is going to be, there's going to be more people that are less afraid to say what they really think. 
I don't think Mike Tyson has any fear of that. Of course not. And I I didn't see Don King on this list, but he's got to be there, right? Is he still alive? Yeah, don't you remember he was holed up at Mar-a-Lago with them? Remember that he gave like a joint press conference with Trump? (laughs) That's right. He he was all bedazzled in his Make America Great Again (laughs) little outfit with his flags and... Don King is 86 years old. Oh, he looks great. (laughs) He does. Wow. You know why he looks great? Because he's not hanging, he's not touring the country in strip clubs. (laughs) Oh, and you know what? I bet he's going to let Trump speak at his funeral. (laughs) You believe that? That's so petty. John McCain. I, that, I I actually don't have a problem with John McCain saying he doesn't want Trump at his funeral. I really don't. Because some of the things that Trump said during the campaign, uh, look, uh, Ted Cruz has already buried the hatchet with Trump, re- mm-hmm. you, you know, because he's a politician and he knows things are said during campaigns uh, that are ridiculous, mm-hmm. you know. But but John John McCain holds a grudge. <laughs> in a way that uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that he would say, I don't want Trump at my funeral. Yeah, but then he surrounds himself with the loathsome. Like, I'm reading a piece in uh, NBC Los Angeles talking mm-hmm. about McCain's being visited by friends and family. He just had a surgery. Guess who sat with him for 90 minutes? Ugh. I, I, I couldn't tell you. Good old Uncle Joe Biden. Of course. Mm-hmm. That's what kills me about this man. He's, look, I, I respect the man's military career. He's been a garbage senator. He was a terrible presidential candidate. And he's not uh, above criticism, even though he is dying. When he comes out and says stuff like that, or, you know, the other big story, I, I guess he's releasing this book. Yes. That, uh, that he he regrets picking Sarah Palin to be his vice presidential nominee. He didn't want her on the ticket. He wanted Joe Lieberman on the ticket. Mm-hmm. Joe freaking Lieberman. The only reason, Tracy, that I could stomach voting for John McCain was he put Sarah Palin on the ticket. Same here. If he would have put Joe Lieberman on the ticket, there's no way in hell I would have voted for him. No. No, and this is the other thing that really ticks me off. Not that I like it when the Senate is in session. Mm-hmm. I'd rather they just went on permanent vacation and met sure. once a year as they're constitutionally obligated to. Uh, he hasn't been seen in public since December. Yeah. So he's not going to work, but he's writing books yeah. and hanging out. Why not just relinquish your seat? It's time. Seriously. They cannot give up their power. No, it's it's disgusting. There was there was talk briefly that 102 year old Orrin Hatch may run for reelection, <laughs> and finally someone said, "Psst, Orrin, you're 102, and I can't feel your pulse. Maybe it's time to give up." Yeah, you've been clinically dead since 2008. <laughs> But it, it, what D- John McCain is every bit the dick Donald Trump is. Yes. Every bit the dick Donald Trump. He's, no, he's classier about it. Yeah. Like, he's a classier dick. Well, a classier dick is still a dick. Yeah. No, anybody I'm, that would invite Joe Biden to their bedside <sighs> as they're dying. Talk about, oh, he's so offended by Trump. Honestly. Did he? I wonder if uh, Joe, crazy Uncle Joe, groped Cindy McCain at all while he was there. <laughs> no, he likes him way younger. Uh, no, he's an equal opportunity groper. Oh, well, that's true. Yes, but he didn't get caught on a hot mic saying anything about groping anybody. So he just is photographed and videoed doing it hundreds of times. And I love the stories about him skinny dipping in front of his uh, Secret Service. But at least he doesn't send out mean tweets, Tracy. Right, right. No, no he... it's it, 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 the whole the whole Sarah Palin thing. It's just a, it's a dick move on his part. 
Oh, it's sucking up to the left, the lefty media, of course. Yeah. And it's also like you were a crappy candidate, dude. If you think that it, Sarah Palin sunk you, you, you still don't understand what happened. And it's the same thing with Hillary Clinton still not understanding why she lost. Right. Oh, it was those Russian bots and that damn Jim Comey. I mean, how many times, uh, you know, we saw it with, with George H.W. Bush when he nominated Dan Quayle. Mm-hmm. And there were, you know, the, conversa- the conversation, the national conversation was that Dan Quayle wasn't ready to be president of the United States. Mm-hmm. George H.W. Bush still won. Because right. he was a better candidate than Michael Dukakis. Correct. The GOP, and Michael Dukakis had way more experience than Barack Obama did. In right. He had been the, a damn governor. The GOP nominated a man, even back then, who was you know 89 years old, mm-hmm. back in 2008, to run against Barack Obama, who couldn't have looked younger next to John McCain if you put a baby's bottle in his hand. <laughs> Young, full of energy. And then at one point, McCain was still ahead in the polls until he decided that that some brainiac in his campaign decided to suspend his campaign because of the crisis. You got to go back to Washington and fix this. Let's give those banks almost a billion dollars. My friends. Yes. Save them. Just resign already. Retire. Yeah. It's time. Come on, I didn't realize that he hadn't been there since December. That's obscene. Right? And it, have you heard that anywhere? It's buried in this no. article. I, I think it's the last paragraph. Can you imagine if Ted Cruz, who is, what, in his late, no, mid-40s I think he's mid-40s, still, yeah. yeah. If he had cancer and hadn't been in office uh, or hadn't been to work in five, six months, there would be calls for him to step down. Yeah. But it's John McCain. It's different. Mm. He's a dick. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I feel bad for his family. And I feel bad for him that he has cancer. But th- what I'm seeing in the news in the last week, there's there's no reason to, to, to put an axe in Sarah Palin's back. I bet, uh, honestly, I would be curious if you gave Sarah Palin truth serum... <laughs> I'd be curious as to if she regrets joining that ticket. I bet who you knows, she does. I bet you she does too. Who knows how her career, her political career would have turned out. She probably would have been a two-term governor in Alaska who, yeah. who you know, served both terms. And then who knows what happens. Maybe she's a, a senator right now. Yeah. No, I, it destroyed her life without a doubt. As you remember, they just kept throwing frivolous lawsuits at her in, in Alaska. Yeah. Until she stepped down and then everybody's like, oh, what a quitter. Do like, you really want her spending the state's money to confront all this? This is what the left does. And speaking of, that silly lawsuit the DNC filed, have you heard anything about that? Of course not. No. Because this is a joke. Just like this Mueller thing with the, the troll farms. That is so beautiful that that's going to blow up in their faces. <laughs> well, it's ridiculous. You know what else is ridiculous? Hmm. It's already been an hour. Wow. We've flown through an entire hour. How about that? It's excellent. Anything else you want to talk about before we end this? No, I think that was everything that was on my list. Remember, you can always catch the Enough Already podcast on SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes. And are we on YouTube? I will get us up on YouTube this week. Okay. So Listen, the last th- two or three weeks haven't gone up yet. But by me asking that question, it is not criticizing Tracy L. Connors because it takes a lot of work to get us on YouTube. It's a little bit of a pain. But I will suffer through it for you all, <laughs> fine people. So you can catch us on YouTube as well, ladies and gentlemen. Or, of course, you can always find us at enough already dot us final thoughts tracy uh 
I got nothing. Oh, you know what? There was one more little brief thing. Okay. That I did want to talk about. St. Comey got busted lying. Oh? Yeah, he um, he presented on any show that would have him to talk about his book. Mm-hmm. And he was questioned by Brett Baer, by Chuck Todd, and I think Jake Tapper about this claim that Trey Gowdy and a few other people who had seen or had had closed door testimony with Comey, mm. that during that closed door testimony, they said Comey had told them that the people that the, the two investigators that went to speak to Michael Flynn back in January mm. had reported back in their notes that they did not think that Michael Flynn was being deceptive. So I do think Comey might be engaging in a little bit of um, this was a, a word that the judge used with the Mueller guys in the troll case. Uh, petty foggery. Have you ever heard about this? <laughs> no. I think it's hilarious. Uh, it, the actions of a petty fogger is a trivial, trivial quarrel. So it's it's basically like playing semantical games mm-hmm. to bicker or quibble over trifles or unimportant matters. So. Comey had said he never said that to them. No, I never said that the investigators didn't think that Flynn was lying. Well, when the uh, the House Republicans put out their big, long report, which is something I plan to dig into when I have Ugh. time to read 250 pages or whatever it is, they, there was some redactions made, of course, for national security reasons. And part of those redactions included this, this piece where Comey talks about this that Gowdy had mentioned and both Comey and McCabe behind closed doors had said the agents that interviewed Michael Flynn thought he was telling the truth. So that doesn't mean that what he said was not inaccurate. It's kind right. of how this argument goes. But he genuinely thought he was telling them the truth. So you can take that as I take that as Comey's lying. I could see how it could go either way. You see this a lot, really, Mm -hmm. in every either office situation or businesses in general, where the higher ups don't want to take the the person's word for it. You know, with the the, who have the their boots on the ground, who are actually Mm -hmm. doing the day to day work, and you know, you got these agents that say, "Well, we we kind we believe them, Mm -hmm. or at least we don't we, we don't feel like he's being deceptive." But someone up above who has an axe to grind, they don't want to take the word of the people who actually talk to them. Well, I don't know, because they did share this with the ha- the House committee. So they say, Director Comey testified at the committee that, quote, the agents deemed no physical indications of deception. They didn't see any change in posture and in tone, inflection and in eye contact. They saw nothing that indicated to them that he, this is uh, Flynn, knew he was lying to them. Deputy Director McCabe confirmed the interviewing agent's initial impression and stated that, quote, the conundrum that we faced on their return from the interview is that although the agents didn't detect deception in the statements that he made in the interview, the statements were inconsistent with our understanding of the conversation he actually had with the Russian ambassador. Mm. So what they're saying is Flynn was convinced that he wasn't lying to them, but since they had the the transcript of that phone call, they knew that what he was saying was incorrect. So well, maybe he was just speaking his truth, Tracy. It could be. Well, I mean, this is coming from Andrew McCabe, who's still out there claiming he didn't lie three times. Or four, excuse uh. me, four times, one of them to Comey, but the other three under under oath. Fun times. Yeah. Yeah. All right. With that, we're going to end this. Thanks for listening. She's Tracy L. Connors. I'm Fingers Malloy. We'll be back next week with an all new Enough Already.